All right, so a really quick vlog for today. It's our first Caterina Sforza experimenty workshop. So I just wanna give some instructions and then let's just go crazy in the comments. I'm putting it on the blog so that everything would be kept in perpetuity um, and we, you can link to it. If we come up with a really great translation, you can cite it um, as a group effort and use it in your um, Kingdom ANS entries, if you'd like. Um, I think this is the best way to do it, but I wanna give some instructions first. Um, I know a lot of you are advanced and you don't need this, but for anyone who's following along who really wants to learn how, um, I wanna show you what I, what I did when I started. Um, I am not a linguist. I speak, I spoke Spanish um, for travel, right? I didn't grow up speaking another language, but I understood a little bit of Latin and I understood Spanish. And I, when I started studying Italian, it was really similar to Spanish. And if I just built on that foundation and built on that foundation. So everything I learned um, helped me understand, you know, how to get to the next step. So I did not start off speaking multiple languages and, and being fluent and understanding all of this. Also, the Italian that we are translating is not modern Italian. It is um, a mixture of dialect and Latin. It's archaic. It is, um, it is different than modern Italian. So even if I spoke Italian um, to begin with, this would still be a stretch because I know people, I have friends in Italy and I show them these recipes and they're like, that doesn't make any sense because these words are archaic and they're a mixture of the dialect of the, of the region and Latin. There was no standardized Italian until, you know, as we know it, until a very modern period. So let's just jump right in. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, we're going to share. And I'm not going to heavily edit this video. <clears throat> so hopefully I don't make too many mistakes. Um, but I do have a dog, so you might hear him barking. So now you're seeing my screen. I have the, uh, the blog post up, right? So thank you for joining me. This is so exciting. And it's a little rushed, yes. And so the next video and the next uh, recipe we'll choose together. Um, I just wanted to get off the ground with this right away. And we thought about it yesterday. I posted about it. There was interest. So let's just, I figured let's just jump in. So um, first, let's talk about who Katerina Sforza was um, and then talk about what her book is, the book that I'm using for these translations. And then let's talk about the foundations of um, scholarship that have been laid by other researchers, right? Because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so this is the title page, actually, from her, the book, that I actually have a copy of now. It's been, I've been waiting, waiting, waiting. I never thought I would actually own a physical copy, and now I do. I'm so happy. Anyway, um, so Katerina is amazing. I have loved her for years. I have studied her. I have tried to visit all the sites in, in um, Emilia Romagna that I can find that are connected to her, even if they're closed. I'm like at the gate looking at Ravaldino, like, oh. Um, so I love her. I'm, I'm an Italophile and I really love strong women. And she was one of those. So let's just talk about her timeline, right? She was born in 1463 to the Duke of Milan. She was his illegitimate daughter um, from a mistress but he raised her with all of the rest of his children um, to, be, uh, to be a noble woman, right? Um, 1477, she married Girolamo. I'm not gonna be able to switch back and forth between Italian and, and English properly. So Riario, who was the favorite nephew of Pope Sixtus IV. Um, 10 years later, 11 years later in 1488, her husband was assassinated. And she was named regent of Imola and Forli, which is in Romania. Um, uh, another 11 years pass, and here she is still holding on to her lands, uh, still defending them for her children's sake um, so they can have an inheritance. And she defends against Cesare Borgia um, during his siege of Imola. And um, roughly another 10, 11 years later, she passes away in Florence. So not a very long life, but a very colorful one. Um, there are people who wrote about her during her life. We have lots of accounts. We have letters, thanks to Pasolini, who wrote the three volumes that we're using the third volume of with, with her recipes. He wrote about, um, in 1893, he published this uh, th trilogy, right, of information he could find about her, about her life, um, also documents. He transcribed all the documents he could find, letters, um, 
the recipes from the manuscript, accounts of other people, modern, uh, uh, contemporary to his time. Um, so it is just a great piece of work that we have from him that captured things that could have been lost because her bones were lost. So all of the other stuff, all of this other stuff could have also been lost, but we have it because of Pasolini. So um, we are using his volume three. Um, Katerina is, is um, if you want to read more about her, go to her Wikipedia page to start, right? You can start there. Um, there's a great book, The Tigress of Four Lee. Um, there is another book, and I can't remember the author of that one, um, but I will post them in the, uh, I'll post them on the blog page. So you can, if you want to know more about her, you can read more about her. Um, the book by Pierre Pasolini, it's a little cumbersome, but it's available in English online for free. Um, you can read that. Uh, just type in Caterina Sforza Pasolini and you should find a PDF copy for free all over the place, Google Books and archive.org. Um, we know that she has left us not only one of the most complete um, pieces of literature that allows us to understand the medical knowledge of the time, like late, not from a doctor though, like useful medical information from a lay person, um, it helps us understand alchemy of the time. It helps us understand women's cosmetics of the time. Um, but she also left us her progeny, right? Her son, Giovanni delle Bandanere, uh, was a condottiere and he um, was famous, right? He inherited his mother's gift for military strategy and his grandfather's gift too. Um, and then her grandson, Cosimo I, uh, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, um, through him, her blood still runs through um, the veins of people in the noble houses of Europe. So she has a great legacy and I love her. I could wax poetic about her forever. I have other blog posts about her. So if you type in Katarina Sforza, you're going to find other things about her that I've written because I'm a fan. So this, uh, oh, this is a page from the manuscript that is still in existence. Um, that was written by her son's captain. So her son Giovanni um, loved his mom and probably really respected the legacy she passed on to him and all the great things she taught him. So he took her still room book. He took her book, gave it to his captain, her, well, her manuscript, right? It was handwritten, gave it to his captain and said, hey, transcribe this because I, I want it to last. I don't want this to, to pass away into, into obscurity. Um, transcribe this for me. Um, so this captain, Cupano, did this. So Katarina's original still room book, her manuscript is, is gone. We don't know where it is. If anyone has it, they ha they're not talking. Um, but Cupano's manuscript, we do have. It is in the hands of a private collection. I wish I knew. I wish I knew who had it so I could ask if I could visit their house. I don't think they would let me, but I, I, would, I would go and like knock on the door and be like, can I just please, because look at this page, look at this page. This is a page written by a man who held Katerina's manuscript and who knew her son intimately. Um, so this is what Pasolini worked from when he was writing her, her recipes. Um, and like I said, private collection, we don't know who has it, but if anyone out there knows and wants to let me know, I won't tell anyone else. I'll just go to their house. All right, so the experiments, right? And I always have a problem saying this word and switching from Italian to English is not gonna help me do it any better, but li experimenti means the experiments. That is the name that was given to the book that um, Cupano transcribed. So from her birth, 1460, right to her death in 1509, she compiled recipes. She was really interested in not only helping other women, right? Um, she, she's quoted saying, I care about women. Um, she spent time helping people in the areas that she was regent of. Um, she would actually use her own recipes if they were sick to help them. We have correspondence from Katerina to other alchemists and scientists and doctors and midwives all over um, the Italy's to ask them about their recipes and exchange information. She grew a, a garden, um, for the express purpose of having all the, all the plants she would need to conduct her experiments. And some of these were medicinal. In fact, one of the recipes um, in, in her book is uh, for an anesthesia, right? 
Um, others are to do things like restore virginity. Um, others are do things are to do things like um, help to keep your chest firm and youthful, um, help to keep your skin beautiful, help to freshen your breath. I mean, all of these things that people are concerned with now, they were concerned with then. So from, you know, probably the time she married Riario to the time she died, she was involved in writing down the experiments she conducted, writing down these recipes, testing them, trying them, sharing them. And we have all that information from Pasolini in his three volumes. Um, I covered that the original manuscript is lost. Um, so let's just jump into the copy that I have. So volumes one and two are not her recipes. Volumes one and two are the story and then some an ancillary information. Volume three is called, if you can see here, volume three is called Documenti. These documents are amazing. I have spent, I've, I've only got the book two days ago. Um, I've gone through, there's letters that she has, that have been transcribed that she wrote to the Duke of Milan to ask for help when she was trying to defend against Cesare. There's letters that she wrote to the Duchess of Ferrara to exchange um, hunting dogs. She also sent recipes to some of these really famous noble people. Um, if she heard about an ailment or they wrote to her about an ailment, she would hey, say, hey, look, I have this recipe. You can give it to your apothecary, see if they can come up with it and use it and see if it will help you. She also actually wrote to a couple of um, Jewish women. One, Anna Ibrea, um, was a noted apothecary or midwife of some type who was known for her own experiments. So Anna Ibrea is uh, her, the letters that she, that Anna wrote to her and that she wrote to Anna are also included in volume three. So these documents are kind of amazing. And it's gonna take me a long time because this is like an 800 page book. So moving on, um, back to here. So the experiment, um, Number 39 is the one I picked to start with because it's really short and it, it has a lot of terms that I'm already familiar with so I can help you uh, go through them instead of choosing something that I am completely unfamiliar with. Um, but we're going to do that too because um, it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay not to know things. Um, it's okay to be learning something. My, one of my mottos that I took from um, a famous man of the past is ancora in baro, which means I am still learning. I am learning. So number 39. In Pasolini's volume three, what he has done is there is the page number of um, his book, right? The volume three. But then he includes the page from the Cupano manuscript. And he includes the number um, so we can keep track of the, the order of the, the recipes. So you have the page number from the original manuscript, you have the number of the recipe, you have the title is in italics, and then you have the recipe, which is in regular text. So let's start with number 39 because it's short. Um, also, before, uh, yeah, before we do that, let's just talk a little bit about the references down here. I've given you links, all the links that I can find that I would use if I were doing this by myself. Um, so if I looked here, oh wait, one other thing I need to pull up. How do I get this on the screen? I need to pull up. So you see some of these have uh, symbols. The, the recipe we're doing today doesn't, but the one above it and the one below it has some symbols that, that we don't understand. And also maybe some, uh, yeah. These symbols, you need to know what they mean. So I, I'll have a link. I believe I have a link below to yes. So this is the Italian weights and measures from the Middle Ages um, book. It is available on Google Books and it is searchable. So you don't need to buy it. You can use it online. And it has information on not only the weights and measures for Italy, but we know that Italy wasn't Italy then, right? It wasn't, wasn't unified until just about the time um, of the Civil War, right, in, in America. So those Italian city-states were their own areas with their own dialects and their own 
weights and measures. So this book has as many of them as I've ever seen put together. Each region has a code and inside the region, if there were differences, this author tried to account for them. So he will tell you exactly what an oncia or oncia would be in Ferrara down to the gram. Like he, he gives you a lot of information. So you can click here and look that up. Um, but for this recipe, I guess we don't have to go so much into it, but the next time I do a video where we're um, translating one that does have these symbols, these apothecary symbols, we'll talk about uh, how we can know what they mean. So step one, I basically translate the title first um, and I make notes on like, what is the purpose of this recipe so that I know the context of what I'm reading when I get further down. Um, I also try to figure out, is it just, is it medicinal only? Is it cosmetic? Is it a domestic thing? Like a soap for your cleaning your house or an ink or a stain remover, because those are also found in still room books. Um, or is it more of an alchemical con concoction? Because we know that alchemists were after certain things, certain magical and mystical things. Some things they did were very scientific and accurate, but some things they wanted to achieve are not possible. So they were, you know, trying to figure out how to turn some things into other things that you just, we, transmutation that can't happen, um, but they do have recipes for them. Um, so I just try to figure out in the realm of recipes, is this a recipe that I should translate and think that I can you know, recreate to get um, the desired result or not? So if you're trying to turn you know, lead into gold, probably isn't gonna work. But this, um, a guarire, La Rosessa del Voto. So let's translate the title. Um, I have down at the bottom a link to the Florio 1611 dictionary because it is searchable. There's also the 1598 one, but you have to go um, page by page. So um, I'm just going to type in and see what it says. So Guardare, guardati, guardatore, guardatura, guarire. Oh, here we are. Guarire. To cure, heal, or recover from some hurt or sickness. Okay, so now we know. And I guess I should be writing this down, right? <laughs> I'm going to make a note over here. So. I'm going to just write this down in my notes. You guys can't see it because that's not the part that I've shared, but this is what I would be doing if I was actually translating this. I would have a document up and I would be writing everything in it. Um, so let's make a new one for Katerina Sforza, number 39. Okay, so gua vire is to cure or heal, okay? Also to recover. All right, so I know that in most of these recipes, ah is the same in Spanish and Italian too. So um, to cure, and this is not a conjugation of it, it's the actual verb itself. I can't remember the term right now. Um, so to cure, to cure what? La rosesa del volto. Rosesa is the next word we need to do. Oh, and also just to say that Google Translate is not going to always be accurate because we're talking about not modern Italian, right? Not standard Italian, dialect, Latin, they call it vulgar, right? It's just a, it's a weird thing, right? Medieval and Renaissance language can be very weird, can be very strange. So Google Translate isn't always going to help you, but sometimes it will. You can always keep it on hand. So let's just type this in because it could also be, look, heal, guarire, to heal. So it tells you over here, heal, cure, recover, convalesce. Okay, so this verb may still be used, right? And it has a, a Latin base likely. So even if it did change to another, um, to, to maybe an archaic use and they have like another word that they use today, this word may still be known by modern Italians. Uh, that's always good to know. So keep your Google Translate available. It's not always gonna be accurate and you have to think critically about what it's telling you and see if it fits in the context, but 
This makes sense to heal, you know, and Florio agrees. So yay. Um, to heal or to cure what? La Rosesa. So let's look up Rosesa. And I love this because you can just type it in and not, don't let your, don't let your autocorrect because that will do bad things. So Ro. Nope. So Rosesa is not here, but Rosetta is, Roseo is, Roseto is. So it looks like it has to do with roses, right? And I know that Rosso is red. Um, lots of roses are red, rosy cheeks. I wonder, I wonder if that has anything to do with this. So let's go here, see what this says. Nope, it says Rosesa, it translate from Portuguese, no. But I have a feeling it has to do with rosy or red, right? I have a feeling. So I'm just gonna write down my hunch. I don't have an exact translation for roses, uh, but I think red, rose, rosy. Makes sense. All right, so that we're going on context. The next two words are del volto. So let's look up, uh, I don't know if it's gonna tell you this, this one, but let's just look it up, del. It does. Of. Okay. So I knew that because it's also used modernly, um, also in Spanish. But so del, my poor little keyboard, del means of the. So to cure rosesa of the, of the what? Hmm. What's this last one? Volto. So let's go here. Let's type in volto. Volta, volta doppio, twinkle of an eye. I didn't know that. Hmm. Volta, volte, volto, a face, a visage, a look, a countenance, a favor or cheer of a man. So a face, the face. So volto. So to cure rosiness, redness of the face. I think we have a title um, and I'm going on a hunch because that's what I do. But, you know, if I did not know what that word meant at all, I'm guessing in the context of, of what we're talking about, what it could mean. And I'll keep drilling down to see if I can find it. So, um, okay. So I don't want to get off on a tangent there, but I will keep that note there with the question mark next to Rosesa. And, um, and then keep going. So number 39, we have the title to cure or heal the maybe redness or rosiness of the face. All right, and so now the actual recipe, pilia, cerusa, aqua rosa, olio de viole, eh? I can't read it in front of you guys. Et mastica, enseme et unie la faccia. All right, so I know what pilia means because it's in so many recipes um, that I've learned, but that's why you take notes because once you learn it and you have it in your note, you can just use it again. You don't have to look it back up. And eventually you'll remember the, the, um, the words that, the, the verbs, the verbs of, of action. So if you're gonna combine or mix or whatever, those words are gonna be used over and over again. So I keep notes so I can go back to that, but let's see what this says pilia means. Oh wait, hold on, it's here. So if you see it at the end, that means that's on the next column. So you just go down here, next column, and it'll show you at the top. So it takes you pilia, there we go. Um, pilia. Take and hold. Oh, to take. Okay, a hue and cry. I don't know. 
what that part means, but from my studies, I, I use it for take. Piliare, here, this is, this is the verb that we're talking about. Piliare, to take. A, a hue and cry, I wonder what that means. Um, so we're gonna say to take. And let's just see if that's a maybe a modern also word. Yep, takes. All right, so we have um, checked two things, two sources to, to check out that word. So we take, what do we take? Take serusa. All right, so serusa. And this, I'm, this is going really slow. If you want to speed up to the end, you can. Um, but serusa, so this, is probably going to be an ingredient, right? But let's see if it's in the serusa. Mm -mm -mm, not cities. Serusa. Ser u. Ser oops. Serusa with two s's um, as cirosa. So now we need to look up cirosa. 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 Cerus or white lead. All right, so this is white lead. Now I know hmm, that white lead is dangerous. And in my notes on this page and the directions that I, I tell you, you know, translate the title, making a note of the purpose of the recipe, right? You use these things. Um, you can also use Google search to determine, you know, if, if you hit some dead ends to see if anyone else has translated the recipe, right? Because if you just type in the exact Italian-ish from the recipe, someone else could have already translated it and you don't have to do any work except back checking theirs. Um, but then when you get to the recipe, you wanna make note of the verbs, like I said, also the ingredients, especially if you are thinking of redacting or, or making the recipe, you need to make sure you understand what ingredients you should not put on your skin or inhale or have in your house, etc. So I have a couple of suggestions here for places where you can look up to see, um, you know, the safety of an ingredient. Uh, material data safety sheets, material safety data sheets uh, from my days as a scientist are something we used, um, but those things are available online to anyone. So you can look for material safety data sheets. Um, the Environmental Working Group, EWG Skin Deep Database, uses that to inform their, um, their results. So if you were to go to the EWG Skin Deep Database and type in lead, it would give you some information on it. Um, you can also go to something like this, uh, let's see, this modern herbal. I typed in violet, right? It gives you a look at what the violet would look like and, and the modern information on whether something is safe or not would be here. This uh, database is nice because it actually goes into the past. So this will tell you, hey, in this 10th century herbal, this violet was um, mentioned and this is what they considered it. it talks about Ascom's herbal, um, goes into literature. So I like this database because of that. They also go into the past. Um, you can also find herbals online. So if you went to um, Gerard's herbal is a good one because it's in English. Um, so if you went to his on Google Books and you typed in Violet, for instance, and you searched, you would come up with uh, page 49 and 50 looks like that's the Violet. So look, it tells you a description of the flower, also a drawing of the flower, um, description, the place. So this says this type of flower grows in Dalmatia, Gorizia, and Piedmont. So we know that this is the type that would have been available in one of the Italy's. Um, the names, so you find other names it was called by, and then the virtues and the nature. So it'll talk about what they felt as far as like humors and what the this medicinal properties of the plant were at, at the time and period. So um, Gerard was born in like, I don't know, the late 16th century. Some of his publications were in the 1600s, but he was compiling the information at the end of our period in the SCA. So it is, it's fine to use this. I think this one might be from 1630, um, but Gerard himself was born in like 
1580, something like that. So it, it's applicable. All this knowledge did not leap fully formed from his head after 1600. All right, so we have a modern herbal, we have Gerard's herbal. Um, I'm gonna say lead is bad. Uh, let's just go to the EWG. Skin, here we go. Cosmetics database. I don't even know. No. LEAD, lead. Products, brands, ingredients, water. Huh. I wonder why. White lead? Mm -hmm. Nope. Nope, it's not there. So I don't know why that isn't here. Maybe I'm not looking at the right. Um, So let's just go to Wikipedia to start. White lead, history. Talks about how you make white lead. Talks about paints, art pigments. Uh, uh, uh. Let's see. All right, so lead poisoning, lead and zinc pigment. So if you look at some of these references here, it might give you a better idea of whether this is safe. And I'm gonna tell you it's not safe. It will corrode and ruin your skin over time. It, it feels really great though, I'm gonna tell you. That's why they used it, it felt, it feels like butter. Anyway, so now we know to guard against some type of redness uh, or rosiness of the face, take cerusa, which is white lead, also aqua rosa, also oleo de viole, and do some things to it, right? I'm going to leave the rest to you guys. Um, let's talk about it in the comments what you think the rest of the recipe is telling you to do, what the rest of the ingredients are. Um, and if you want to try this, I can tell you about a lead substitute. So in the next video, we could do that. I don't know how long I've been talking, but I don't want to make this too, too long. So go ahead and finish translating it. And then we'll start thinking about what we want to do next. Um, and I'll try to do these once a week or once every other week to, um, and, and keep them on the blog. And I'll update uh, the Cadoro Italian Salone Facebook group with um, new blog posts. And as we get through this, like I said, if you want to try it on your own, feel free, just make sure, you know, use, well, for instance, <laughs> ingredients, violet extract. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is what it will give you concerns about this situation. And this one basically says it's very low for reproductive toxicity, immunotoxicity, cancer, products with the ingredient, body wash cleanser, and then the sources. So now you can see that um, the Skin Deep database gives it a rating, um, but it will tell you more about the actual ingredient. Um, white lead, and then the modern herbal talks about violet. Gerard's herbal talks about violet. So you have a lot of information on why they would have chosen that for this particular recipe. And he also gives you the scientific name so that, uh, 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 here we go. So that when you were looking for the ingredient, you get as close to the kind they would have had as possible. Because if you get an American violet, it may not give the same scent or have the same properties and give the same um, effect. All right, so I think that's it. Uh, I'm gonna just try to put this online. Um, like I said, all the links here below are the ones I thought were interesting to me and useful for you. And then for those of you who are super advanced and who probably want to work ahead, because this will be like really quick to knock out. Um, I found this, y'all, I found this uh, excerpt on Wikipedia for Katarina Sforza. I was trying to look up um, the names of her other husbands because she was married more than once really quickly. So I went to Wikipedia to get that. And I noticed at the bottom, there were some different things there. And it was an excerpt of, this is, this is what Cara, uh, Katerina was described as um, in her time period by a historian um, 
from Florence. And so I read it and I was like, this is a horrible translation. Someone took the original um, Italian dialect, Florentine, and just put it in Google Translate and then put that translation here. It, it, it's, it's disjointed. Um, some of the words are translated directly and not in context. It's not a translation that, that flows, that makes sense. Um, so I put that here because I thought it was horrible. And then I was like, well, I wonder what he actually said about her. I wonder where it actually is. And then I spent like two and a half hours last night when I should have been making this video, um, looking up where he got it from or where this person got it from. And I found it. Um, there's some words that I couldn't really see because all I could find was snippets, but I found it. It's from um, Storia Fiorentina, page 266. Um, and these are the snippets. And so I transcribed as close as possible to the original, the snippets uh, information here. And some of the, some of the words make sense. They, they go together, but like here, he says, uh, or she, or they, they say that woman with weapons in hand was proud and cruel. And I look down here and I see Caladona, my conobe, paura, e colarme, which I think is con larme. So with arms in hand, she was fierce and crude, cru cruel, crude, cruel, fierce and cruel. But that's, it's just, it doesn't flow right. So if you guys want to work on that, to actually have an excerpt of what someone from her time period said about her, um, that might be something you want to tackle. All right. So signing off, I will join you in the comments below and talk to you about the recipe. Bye.